Okay. All right. I think perhaps we'll get started. Do I dear? Yeah, let's get started. Okay. Um, welcome everyone. Uh, this is a film quarterly webinar. If you haven't taken part in one before, uh, this has been one of the few pleasures of the pandemic era that we've been able to start doing these webinars um, as a small compensation for not traveling around, but it's really been terrific. And this session today um, has really been inspired um, by the publication of two pieces, um, uh, Christian Rosapal's article um, in our current issue that was published in March of Film Quarterly, Volume 74, Number 3, um, his quite remarkable article, Poet Poetics of Refraction, Mediterranean, I'm stumbling, Mediterranean Migration and New Documentary Forms. And um, in that, um, he discusses at great length the films by two of our other panelists by um, Amal Alzakut, who is the maker, among many other films, of Purple Sea, which you very well may have heard of, and Dagmawi Yimer, who, um, among many other films that he has made, um, is uh, the filmmaker behind Azmat, uh, which also um, he discusses. And, um, the other inspiration for this is the recent publication of a book edited by James Williams called Queering the Migrant in Contemporary European Cinema. And, and um, we thought we'd put these together and that we would try to have a conversation um, as summertime and um, uh, migrant season gets underway in earnest. Um, with all its successes and all its grim realities, try to have a conversation about what a cinema uh, about these experiences uh, would look like. Um, what is um, a representation that is adequate or that is legitimate? And to hear from the filmmakers themselves, um, as well as, um, you know, uh, as well as from the scholars who've been studying this. So it's a chance to talk about this. I'm going to, um, uh, sorry. Um, and I'm going to talk about this with you and with everyone on this panel. So we're going to start uh, by hearing from Christian Rosapal. Um, and let me explain how this is going to be structured. Uh, the first third of the session, uh, the filmmakers and scholars are going to speak briefly, uh, maybe um, uh, seven minutes each. So the first half hour, you're going to be hearing from everybody. And then we're going to open it up between them and have a conversation among everyone up here on this panel. And then in the final half hour, maybe even earlier, we're going to start looking at your questions and answers um, and bringing them into our conversation and having a dialogue with you, our invisible audience. So that's the way we run these. I also want to let you know that the full bios of everyone on the panel are going to be showing up in the chat so that you can see them there. I'm not going to spend our time giving everyone the lengthy introduction they deserve. And um, also, uh, there will be links that are posted, links to their films, links to Chris, Christian's article. And um, I also uh, want to point out that this session is being recorded and it will live on forever for your future access on the filmquarterly.org website, where our earlier webinars are also available so that it's this has a wonderful life it goes into teaching it goes into circulation among all of you who are here today uh, to share with people who couldn't be with us so we have more than a hundred um, participants in the room I think it's time to start hearing from the panelists um, and let me start uh, with you Christian speaking to us from Stockholm Christian Rosapal thank you so much Ruby. Um, I'm very grateful to be here with you, with Amal, uh, Dagmavi, and James. Um, and I also want to thank Film Quarterly for making this possible. And I'm thinking I don't want to talk too much here at the outset. I'm really here to, to listen and be in conversation. 
uh, but I thought uh, I, I could take the opportunity to show a few images that we couldn't include in the article and also give a brief introduction for those of you who haven't uh, had the chance yet to read the article or see the films. Uh, so as uh, Ruby mentioned, the title of the article is uh, Poetics of Refraction. And it was partly an attempt to uh, grapple with this immense saturation of documentary crisis imagery that we are all familiar with. Uh, this sort of violent crisis imagery uh, from the Mediterranean region, the representation of crisis, as well as the crisis in representation, so to speak, over the last decade, and especially after uh, 2015 and, and the so-called European refugee crisis. And instead of reproducing these spectacular crisis images, uh, the films that I discussed uh, in the article, I thought offer an alternative, more grounded and, and intimate perspective on migration or perspectives in plural, different perspectives uh, on migration in the Mediterranean region um, by or from people who live through the experience of displacement themselves. And so by attuning the viewer to these alternative ways of seeing and listening, they enact what I, in, in this article, called uh, poetics of refraction, um, a slowed down and, and angled articulation that challenges the immediacy of the visual that we are exposed to in the news and in more conventional documentary. Uh, so I wanted to take the moment now just to briefly just clarify why I use this uh, term refraction and uh, show a few images that might help. Um, so let's see if we could see one of them now maybe um, from Purple Sea. So as you can see here uh, in this example, everything above water um, appears to be bent. And this is from um, Purple Sea, it's, it's an underwater shot and Amal could tell you more later about how uh, it, would, it was shot and so on. But as you can see, the visuals here are, are bent in a sense. It's a phenom phenomenon known in physics as refraction uh, that you might meet, be familiar with. Um, and refraction here uh, occurs because the sun's rays slow down and when they hit the seawater, and they change directions. Um, if we could see that other image, number seven, um, you can see uh, the same thing happening in the next image here. Um, and in that case, in this case, it's from Dagmavi's film, if, if it will appear. Um, <laughs> there we go. And so you can see something similar happening here. Um, this refraction from underwater. Everything appears to be bent in a sense. Um, and in the article, I give a, a number of other examples. And I didn't want to just highlight this as, uh, let's say, a sort of visual peculiarity or even just as a style, but I wanted to draw attention to how these films um, challenge the immediacy of the visual and it's, it's most clear in, in, this, uh, in these examples, but there is a larger poetics of, of refraction at, at play, I think, and I argue in that piece. Um, so I wanted to draw attention um, to how these films challenge the media, so the visually, of the visual, and especially uh, pain, even death at sea, as a spectacle to be consumed, basically. Um, so we could see a lost slide here. Um, so as I think of it, these uh, poetics of refraction is a way then to try to um, imagine for memory to persist, to tell an impossible story, the story of shipwreck, of death, um, an impossible but still necessary story to be told. Uh, that does not reproduce the violence of 
crisis imagery uh, of victims um, and so on, or even this notion of an exceptional European, uh, quote unquote, European crisis, but rather uh, something that expresses the ongoing catastrophe for those who uh, have to flee. Uh, so, as I argued in that piece, the poetics of refraction then involves not a mere aestheticization of, of suffering, but this is poetry as a vital necessity of existence or expressing your existence. Um, and of course, there, there's lots more to it, but uh, I'll leave it there for now. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thanks so much, Christian, for getting us started. Um, we're going to go next uh, to Amal Azakut, uh, whose film Purple Sea you've already heard referenced. But uh, for you, Amal, uh, really looking forward uh, to hearing what you have to say. And I know your film Purple Sea showed just this past year. You're probably still in the aftermath of showing it everywhere. Um, but uh, the experience it describes took place some years before that, I know, five years before that. So um, turning the floor over to you um, so that we can hear from you. Thanks. Thank you, Ruby, for the introduction and for having me. It's really a pleasure. Um, Purposey, um, um, a film co-directed uh, with Khalid Abdul Wahid, my partner, uh, and uh, produced by uh, Pong uh, Film Production in Berlin. Um, it follows uh, the story of crossing um, from the, the shore of, of Istanbul to the uh, Greek um, shore. Um, in 2015, I was staying in Istanbul, um, uh, apart from my partner who, who was able to um, leave to Germany, and I wasn't able to join him, even legally. So uh, there was um, a hard decision to take that I need to, to, to take the, the boat, the smuggling boat, back then. and. Um, uh, it was in October 2015. When I decided to take the trip, I I wanted to film it. It was as simple as that, that I want to keep the, the, the film, I mean, the, the footage for myself. I wanted to uh, to have it as a memory and also to share it with Khaled, who was very much keen to to to, to be with me because he knew how, how dangerous is it. And um, so, the, I mean, the, the, the whole idea of filming has nothing to do with making a film at the end. Uh, and I took everything I had uh, with me back then, the, the mobile phone, the, the, a small camera, and I, I happened to have a small waterproof camera also, which I found it very much uh, like uh, flexible and uh, practical because it's, it's a small, it doesn't have a screen, so you do not look while you are filming. And uh, uh, it has a small band where you could attach it to your, to your body. And of course, it was scary for me to film while, while going on this trip. Um, so I start filming from the first moment where we took the, the we, we were in the smuggler office which was so funny because it was a, a it looked like a, a film production uh, space. Um, and um, I, I, I mean, I was amazed with, with the whole <laughs> fake uh, setup that they had. And uh, I started filming, I, I was filming on the, on the road as well. And um, until the, the moment, it took us 15 minutes from, from uh, Istanbul to the shore, to the assembly point where, where we, uh, should take the the the, uh, the boat, and um, we took the boat. The boat was um, um, supposed to take forty people. We were three hundred and more, and uh, the boat was very very uh, old boat. And uh, um, we were on the boat, and like. 15 minutes later, the boat collapsed and uh, everybody was in the water. So from the moment that the incident happened, I wasn't in control of the camera. And it was the camera perspective all the time, except for one moment I could come to it later, but I wasn't 
I was aware that sometimes I looked at it, at it and it was uh, like there is a small light and that you could see that it's filming or not, but I saw it's on, but I didn't care. I was just uh, uh, not interested. And uh, um, it was very hard to, when I, when I, I mean, I have to, of course, to say that uh, uh, I survived, <laughs> and but many people didn't. Uh, 43 people almost um, died. And I mean, this is the, the latest number back then, but I don't know if they updated it. So um, I, after, after reaching uh, the Greek island, I, I moved uh, to, to Germany and it took me four days to, to come there. And um, after coming to Germany, it was really very, very, uh, of course I was still in, in shock. But I had this feeling that I wanted to see what the camera has filmed. I, I wanted to watch it. I, I was curious. I was really very much um, um, thinking of it because I wanted to see whether I and the camera have the same memory. <laughs> and if, if it, the camera saw what I, I have seen, uh, and I was shocked when I saw the footages for the first time because really it was a different perspective. Uh, for Khalid, it was different. He couldn't look at them. Uh, he, it took him a really long time to, to look at them. Um, and um, um, at the beginning, we haven't thought of making a film. It was the first uh, urge was how to deal with, with what happened and how to go legally to do something because we, we saw them as evidence and we, we wanted to do something. And here also came, came the idea of forensic architecture and working with them because they usually, I mean, this is their work. They uh, uh, deconstruct a crime scene uh, um, and, and just like uh, analyze it and what happened. And I had the urge to, to know what happened exactly and to bl blame someone for it. Um, this was a huge uh, uh, part um, of the whole thing because, um, I mean, it took the, the burden of doing um, a film that is literally saying what, what has happened from, from us. And uh, it made us more focused on, on what do we want to say and uh, what is it? our perspective, what is it my perspective here? What, what do I want to say? And here came the idea of making a film uh, uh, from a personal perspective, but I need to, to, to say it's not, uh, it's not um, individual. It's, uh, it's a collective memory. And the I here in the film is serving, um, it should serve the, the, the um, the collectiveness, uh, so it's not, it's personal, but at the same time, it's not, um, uh, it's not the very uh, uh, private story or, or uh, autobiographical story. So, um, and uh, yes, I mean, it was hard to, to, to finish the film uh, and we had many questions how to deal with the image itself. Um, but and it took it took five years to, to finish it, so it was a long time. But uh, I think we we were able to. <laughs> to Great. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Um, and uh, I am going to move on to Dagmawi in just a second. And I just want to say that it struck me that your, your stories. Uh, you coming through Lampedusa, through Lampedusa, Dagmawi, and you, Amal, having come through Lesbos, these two most notorious spots of emigration and hope and disaster. It's really powerful to have both of you here, so I appreciate it. Uh, Dagmawi, I'm going to turn the floor over to you. Eager to hear from you. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, it was interesting hearing uh, the story that I have heard from Mohammed. And yeah, it's a coincidence that we have such 
such a, a common a common experience of landing in an island so my mind was a little bit dated it's a little bit back in 2006 and uh, of course i used to uh, to see and to 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 assist all the, the the people like me who arrived after war, after I have arrived in Italy, and I was uh, I was filming uh, in Lampedusa asthma. That's that's what why we are here to talk about asthma, of course. And um, it was not my idea of filming. I would have preferred not filming anything similar to that uh, issue. The only thing that convinced me to do and to, 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 to risk such kind of thing was the presence of the names. The names of the people uh, who have died, drowned, and those, thanks to those who have survived, they, they gave their own uh, testimony, how many people and how many names. Uh, and every, everyone was identified. And it was the only moment that people were identified by their name and surname. We, in the past and also in the in, afterward, people die, but n no one knows uh, who they are and what their name was. So in order to use those, that occasion by ge getting the names, I was convinced to, to, to do the film. And, and, and I think the artistic uh, my my own personal uh, involvement in making film is strictly related to my migration experience. And uh, what I want from the doing films is to not to get a mere uh, artistic celebrity, but to do it in a way that my job or my work could. Um, create awareness and immediate uh, know-how and also give a perspective of thinking of single stories rather than a collective uh, stories. Because um, we have seen and my friends always, uh, or director's friends used to tell me many times that the, the documentaries regarding immigration have saturated. Uh, but I don't think that uh, we know about the phenomenon, but we don't know about the migrants. The migrant stories are yet, are, are, are there to be told. Yeah, um, we have, I think that our kids will be able to be distacked or detached from uh, from the politics, the 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 way. Um, uh, Europe and Africans are dealing this situation, um, they will be able to narrate what is happening or what happened to their parents. So I, I, I think the, the, the migration is not yet uh, documented enough. We know about the politics, we know about the suffering, and many times uh, the migrant is uh, supposed to talk about his what he have lived and not what he ha what he thinks about the situation, and that is the the risk of uh, repeating the same stories with mm, different faces, and and that is why people get used to uh, footage, and it's not enough. It's not harsh enough to uh, to get the attention because we have seen continuously uh, footage that um, that do not give uh, the, the, the right dignity of for the for the stories that reach Europe so what I what I uh, work now and um, it's also a, a time of thinking uh, why doing documentaries and what are the external forces that condition me to do a certain kind of film and not another one? What, what, should I be uh, in line with the public interest or should I act differently? In Asmat, I acted without any limit 
of uh, uh, style or time. And the people, or a group of people who who get um, who create who who was created just after the shipwreck in Lampedusa in 2013, uh, they asked me to to cut off the 17 minutes film because it's too long and the names are too much. And I refused to do that. And I refused also to do a, a spot on such kind of uh, stories because it doesn't have sense if those which name should be cut off and which name and, and the artistic representation of uh, um, of uh, of any documentary should keep in mind and should have a principle of why we are doing the films. So if I cut uh, 100 names from uh, 368, what is the sense of uh, doing that film if it is not to sell it or to convoy it to a certain market which is already uh, uh, already lazy in, to, to, to listen to real stories. So maybe um, what I question every time is that all the documentaries are selected stories anyway, and they are edited, and people an image may not be enough to 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 start to, or to put questions among the society because maybe people go to see films and think they know about immigration but at not from from their their houses they might not even speak to the migrants who are living in the neighborhood. So it creates also the laziness and this uh, illusionary uh, awareness about immigration. So this is what I think regarding document, doing documentary and doing films in, uh, as a migrant. Thank you, that's terrific. Thank you um, so much. Uh, for that, Dagmawi. Um, and I want to point out to people that there's a link to your film in, in the chat to follow up on, and also a link uh, for Amal's film in the chat to be able to see. So pay attention to that. And now um, moving on, uh, I just want to hand the floor over to uh, James Williams and hear what he has to say. James? Thank you, Ruby, and thank you for inviting me. And I want to say what a, a great honor it is to be uh, on this um, webinar um, uh, with you and in, with uh, the filmmakers in particular um, who have made some extraordinary films. Uh, I'm looking forward to talking uh, about um, the films, but I'll talk about, um, as you asked, about the project uh, Queering the Migrant in European, uh, contemporary European cinema which is strangely not about, in terms of this webinar, not about documentary cinema at all, really. It's, it's dealing with mainstream narrative fiction cinema and dealing with genre uh, within um, a European cinema, also within European television. Um, so what I tried to do with the contributors, and there were 14 uh, essays that made up uh, the uh, volume, is try to kind of assess where European cinema is right now um, within, as Dagmari was talking about, the sort of surfeit of stories, stories which have, in a sense, been already prescripted of what the, the migrant other is, um, you know, the suffering, traumatized, um, uh, not visible, but hyper-visible sometimes when there's breaking news. I mean, all sorts of kind of codes and conditions about reading uh, the migrant uh, within the European context. And this uh, book is dealing with specifically um, migration to fortress Europe, uh, the new Europe. And uh, so we're looking, uh, my fellow contributors uh, and I, at particular um, uh, aspects of European uh, filmmaking that are trying to come to terms um, with um, queer, the queer migrant. Um, and, and the queer migrant is in a sense sort of doubly abject, if you like, um, because the queer migrant is often perceived as the bad migrant. If there's a good migrant, if there ever you know, uh, is one, and I don't want to use these binaries, but they're there, they exist, and that's what the project is trying to grapple with. 
the queer migrant is often perceived as the, as the bad migrant, uh, the sexual migrant, the alternatively, alternatively gendered migrant that doesn't correspond to the, the migrant who left um, poverty or persecution uh, through war or famine. Um, so it's loaded. Uh, the figure of uh, the queer migrant, um, and that's when it's visible, and often um, it isn't visible um, within um, the sort of European uh, media uh, universe. So, how does one sort of combat these stereotypes, these tropes of um, the suffering, say the, um, um, the, the the Syrian suffering gay refugee? That's one of many. Um, um, stereotypes um, without falling into the trap of objectifying, even exoticizing, fetishizing, suffering, the suffering other. So that was um, a particular um, um, aim that we had collectively to, to, to try to work out whether film, which is a mainstream medium, um, can um, move things forward. Um, can uh, cinema allow us to move beyond borders? And that is cinematic borders, um, borders of binary thinking, um, thinking um, of say the nation, national belonging in terms of the family, how can one move beyond that? Um, could there be a, a kind of queer, a queering of the border? Um, something that's more kind of fluid, something that is sort of trans-border. Um, and I do want to come back in the discussion to um, Christian's use of the term bent, which is very interesting. I would um, like to sort of explore that in terms of kind of queer aesthetics as well, um, your idea of poetics of refraction. Um, but if I can just be sort of clear here, I, I mean, you know, we are dealing in the volume with, you know, European and largely white uh, filmmakers. Um, sometimes they're gay, sometimes not. Um, and they are then kind of trying to process um, these um, saturated stories of uh, the queer um, migrant other in the light of some progressive um, policies within Europe. And I'm thinking in particular of 2011, the SOGI um, um, policies uh, in Europe, which is about allowing gay refugees to um, find asylum in Europe on the grounds of uh, sexual persecution. So there's lots of kind of elements here. Um, and what has been interesting in the volume is, is working out that the films that you may expect to be progressive because they're made by gay filmmakers um, actually reproduce some of the um, stereotypes that are um, bedeviling um, free, creative, progressive ways of thinking about migration and asylum. Um, that reproduce notions of homo-nationalism, for example, which kind of is this sort of very strange and ugly alignment of the ideas of nationalism and um, uh, queer subjectivity. Um, conversely, there are moments um, within the volume where we see um, films um, which are not made by gay filmmakers, which are not about gay migrants, which are actually queering notions of belonging, notions of Europe even. Um, so it's a kind of sort of multi-stranded project in that sense that, that we wanted to avoid is um, simply trying to perform to a script or an expectation um, that if you get uh, queer filmmakers, then you get progressive notions of uh, queer migration and the queer migrant figure. And that figure is sometimes perceived as a savior figure for the white indigenous European, um, or it's um, perceived as, as I say, this traumatized figure, in a sense that things are blocked. And, and I can't say right now that, um, that European cinema is beyond that blockage, but the volume has tried to deal with that. Um, and one of the things that uh, we have done, um, and uh, the interview at the end of the book with Sudeep Dasgupta, who is a curator at the um, Amsterdam International Queer Migrant Film Festival, uh, is just to sort of open up a conversation um, about migration in general terms, about how one can see migration as a queering of uh, binary thinking, of boundaries, of blocked thinking, um, and what I would call a kind of trans-border consciousness. 
uh, that is, um, I think, something that could sort of describe loosely uh, the ethos um, and aim um, of um, the volume. I'll give one example, uh, if I can, just before uh, we move on, uh, of a film that I think does do something new, and it is made by a gay filmmaker, and it's um, a film called A Moment in the Reeds by Mikhail Michaela, a Finnish director, which is about um, a Syrian gay um, refugee uh, in Finland who's not out, um, who has a relationship by chance with uh, a white um, filmmaker, sorry, a white um, uh, character. Um, and they have a moment in the reeds uh, which refers to their sort of relationship, uh, brief relationship, uh, one summer when he, Tarek, uh, the Syrian refugee, is uh, working for um, the family of the white protagonist, um, Levy. And what happens there is that, that um, in formal terms, we're seeing um, the film really trying to subvert the grammar of point of view to try to create a kind of more fluid multi-field of perspectives where we, the viewer, are brought in to something which feels different. So it's on a sort of formal level that things are possible. Um, and um, I, I kind of sort of try to theorize this in terms of a sort of oneness with the characters, oneness with the world. It's a very aesthetic moment um, and beautifully shot in nature. Um, how might one theorize that is something that I personally, in one of my chapters um, for the volume, tried to deal with. Um, but those are few and far between. And, and you know, I, I do want to make the point that, that, you know, even when we have enlightened filmmakers, say like Michael Haneke, working around issues of um, the migrant, or we have someone like Luca Guagardino in A Bigger Splash, trying to kind of expose your white European notions of what the migrant other is when it arrives in their holiday island, for example, um, those filmmakers are quite happy not to credit um, the, the migrants who have been part of that production. And, and you know, that's quite a common thing here. So, so there are all sorts of ironies, there are all sorts of problems around European cinema dealing with migration, um, which we have to acknowledge. Um, I, unfortunately, because there are no real examples, um, very, very few indeed, of um, queer migrants um, speaking in their own voice through film, we are left with these sort of European notions of what the queer migrant is. I'm hoping that that situation will change. Thank you, James. Thank you so much for that. And um, this has been a fantastic beginning. Um, I thank you all uh, for your perceptions, your stories, and um, your thinking. And I want to now um, give, give ourselves um, about 25, 30 minutes to begin talking uh, in greater depth about your work, your thinking, and about your essays. And um, we may uh, also be able to start uh, toward the end of it, taking up some of the comments from the audience. So for those of you out there, if you want to put anything into um, the chat uh, for us to um, relay, uh, for me to relay to the panelists, please do that as well. And um, I wonder, since you're still on camera, James, uh, do you want to start us off um, with uh, thinking through to the next level? Okay. Um, <laughs> no pressure then, Ruby. Uh, <laughs> None at all. Um, well, I think um, for me, there is a question I'd like to ask um, the other uh, panelists, um, and it's to do with the body. <laughs> If I can put it like that, uh, I mean, the, the films I've been talking about that have been discussed in Queering the Migrant um, have been about representation and they've been focused on the body. And, and, and the, the notion that the body is, is where these stories, these projections are being played out and, and how might one have a kind of um, more holistic um, and an integral notion of the queer body. Um, what stands out for me in the, the films by uh, Amal and uh, Dagmawi is the fact that the body is there but isn't there, and we're verging always towards abstraction. Um, Christian calls it a practice of, of refraction, and it's certainly a kind of um, pulverization to some degree of the 
the, the standard sanctity of the body in, in cinema. And, and I wonder, you know, where that does take us. Uh, I mean, does it lead to a new notion of the migrant body, the body? Um, one of the things that I, I thought was very interesting about both films is the attention to the voice, to, to, to the soundtrack, which is made in the case of a Mel's film after the actual lived event. So you're seeing this very sort of um, fragmented um, uh, imagery, but a very clear voice over that was made uh, later on. So there's a gap there um, in the production of the film. Um, and but the same with um, um, Dagmawi's film, um, that you know, we are seeing bodies there, but they're shrouded in linen, they become part of a kind of um, a frame of patterns of shapes. Um, so that doesn't correspond to some standard notions of the figuration of the body, migrant or other. So it's a general question really about where does the body fit in now? It would seem that we move beyond trying to honor the body. And yet there's still this notion of the voice, the soundtrack, the naming, the names that is uh, the crucial thing. So that's, but, that's the question. Thanks, James. Does anyone want to respond to that? Amala Dagmari or you as well, Christian? I could. Um, it's very interesting. Thanks, James, for for bringing this up. It's really an interesting question. And um, this, for instance, in the process of making Purple Sea at the beginning, there was this struggle. Like I, I refused to see myself in the water. I, I hated my image, like being there. And um, uh, we knew from the very beginning, and it was very a collective decision, as I said. Uh, uh, not to show faces, not to show violence about the water. Um, but it was like uh, the, the, the underwater images are, uh, we can describe them as very brutal uh, 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 beauty. Um, they have different qualities of, of uh, um, um, they give different, different feelings and we wanted to 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 know exactly how how do we deal with it. Um, so, um, thinking of the above water images and the underwater images, we had this question, like, what are we showing down there? And um, we we all of us, me, Khalid, and and the, the film team, saw that that the, the little details. Which is which are not little actually. The the the, the bodies we are seeing uh, in the water are are making us re relate more to the to the to the story of like itself. And um, exactly, thanks for that. So so it's like, is it is it empty the water the underwater image? This was the question. It's not empty. It has it has. Um, uh, I'm not talking only about the bodies as bodies, the sneaker, the, 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 the jeans, the, the, um, all the, the, the diver we see, the, we, we see all these details and we could relate, we still could relate and that was amazing because we as human beings don't need to, to see violence to, to understand other people uh, 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 suffering and uh, Coming also to the to the uh, uh, sound and uh, voiceover, I, I think we we also could consider the the voice here as a as a body. <laughs> it's because it's not only um, um, telling the story of what happened exactly. Uh, it's bringing up memories from 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 the past, from the childhood, and even uh, uh, like a uh, future um, uh, thoughts. And uh, it comes from 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 a body. And uh, when we were uh, when we started to, to write the text, also we had this question: of what what do we want to say? <laughs> do we want to tell the people exactly what happened and uh, to let them know that this is and this happened? Which is, I think it's it's really important. People likes to know, but it's not something that that. Um, um, it's hard to know. It's just like I mean, it's, it's it happened. It, 
it's happening and it will keep happening, unfortunately. So we thought of the, the, the intimate place that, that where, where someone in such a situation um, could think of. And uh, we came to, the, to, the, to these memories and connecting with, with, uh, with uh, loved ones. And uh, so I think, and here it was very important also not to refer to the, not to make the, 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 the story in, uh, as an individual story. It's not an, as again, autobiographical uh, film. It's the eye is really, uh, was able to, to first to make this distance between me and uh, uh, the, the person who was in the water at that time, because also I didn't want to see myself as a victim. Uh, so it created the eye really amazingly. I, at the beginning, I thought that it, it won't work because it's an eye. It's bringing the light more to, toward this spot, uh, but it, it really uh, expanded the experience, I think. And um, um, like the voiceover talking from the, 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 um, uh, the time of making the film, uh, was also uh, meant to just not not go to the retrospective and talk from the water because it, it doesn't make sense. It's really, I mean, even for instance, if we want to think about the, the, the text, what, what does it say? Uh, it's impossible to, to for me to bring back the memories that, that the things that I was thinking in the water. So we also had to fictionize uh, uh, the text in, in a way that it's still telling uh, uh, like true stories, but it, it came back from a from, uh, very long time, for instance. And um, like the, the frog um, poem, it's, it's, uh, it exists. It's, I wrote it when I was six years old. Uh, I, I still remember part of it, but most thing I rem remember is knock, knock. <laughs> so we had to rewrite it in a way to, to bring that memory uh, back. And um, yes, I think um, here the, I, I'm, I'm not sure if I really answered the, the Yeah, question, that's. But I think it's, yeah. it's really, it's, it's great uh, to think of, of the voice also as a body in, in this uh, situation. Mm. No, that's a wonderful answer. I'll, an I'll, I'll take over from James and answer. And um, before I go on to Doug Maui or Christian, whoever wants to speak first, I just wanted to say how much I love this idea of the plural I. So you avoid the we, you avoid the you, and you have the plural I, which is, I think, such an interesting, brilliant way into the, the zone of subjectivity and of, of, as you say, making the voice into a body. I, I really appreciate that decision. Um, so thank you. Thank you for sharing that with us. Uh, Doug Maui, Christian, does one of you want to continue this conversation, say something in the same direction or a different direction? Please, Christian. Okay. Um, yeah, maybe I, I to, to go back to Amal, um, you already talked in the beginning about the, the per perspective that it was really the, the camera's perspective, right? That you uh, brought with you. And then you wanted to see if that aligned with your experience or your memory of the experience. And yeah, I'm wondering if you could talk a bit more about the perspectives in the film. In some way, I, I was thinking about it at first that the, the visuals are the camera's slightly separate perspective and, and the the oral, the, the voiceover is your perspective or the eye, the, 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 the artistic or like constructed eye of the film. Um, but maybe there are even more perspectives at, at play here. So I, I wondered if you could say something more about the, the perspectives here and how you see this relation between the camera and, and uh, yeah, your perspective as a filmmaker and your personal perspective, perhaps. Um, I, I think, I mean, um, 
the, the different perspective in the film um, comes from, um, as you said, the, the, the camera, what the camera has filmed. It's a, it's a figure in itself. It has uh, the quality also of, of uh, um, uh, observer. Um, although it, it moves like with, with the body movement, but it's like absorbing it in a way. And um, um, the camera was um, like, um, okay, we, we, we thought of how to uh, bring the whole situation from up and down. And I wish uh, that, that, uh, that Philip Schiffner, the editor is here to, to talk more about that. The editing process, it was really amazingly done by him. Um, like how to, uh, to, to show, uh, like the space underwater, as I said, it's, it gives more uh, a space to the text to, um, uh, to, to speak. And uh, when we go above the water, which was uh, uh, surprisingly uh, uh, different from what we thought that we thought that we will be like uh, go for, for a, a moment that it will be sh shocking but it felt like uh, relieving in a way <laughs> like you are just going up to to breathe because you could not anymore going through uh, this whole thing and uh, um, another layer on the perspective there was a, a very important perspective in the film which is the you and also, I wish Khaled was here to, to speak about it, because uh, there is an I and there is a you. And the you here was the absent one, was the one who's waiting on the shore. And usually, we don't hear a lot of, about the people who are really like waiting their uh, loved ones. Uh, um, it was very hard for Khaled to be in this um, perspective because it's it's um, like it, it's his real perspective and just like to, to talk about it again and to, to be in it it was really hard um, but uh, I, I think also it uh, the, the you also applies to the to you to the, the people who are to, to the spectator who, who are watching the film and um, yeah I think it's like uh, we, we've made many decisions while, while making the film. Um, most of it uh, about the image. Um, this is very, very, very important, but also like uh, the sound, um, like for instance, how to, to make the sound uh, more uh, present. Um, and um, uh, the camera sound, for instance, was very, it's a very bad sound. It's very, not good, and, but but it worked for the, the film because it, you hear the details. You hear um, like very uh, the, the 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 nail is popping in, into the, the the life or the ring uh, life ring. So um, yes, I think it's uh, it was many different layers, um, but yeah. Um, they, they worked together. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Dagmawi, I wanted to go back to what you were saying earlier about um, this, uh, you know, these outrageous requests to cut the number of names, to have you shorten it by leaving out some of the names. And it struck me uh, the way in which your film is such a memorial and yours as well, Amelie, and these, all these words came to mind, like memorial, testimony, evidence, um, expiation, communication, that there are so many words that come to mind in your work that don't always come to mind. And yet you were not artists facing a blank canvas. You were facing a world already saturated with the wrong images or with what you have called, Christian, the exhausted image that no longer serves to reach people who are have made themselves emotionally unavailable. So I want to wonder if you could talk to that a bit. I don't know if I'm applying words to you that you don't want, but I'd love to hear more from you, Degmawi, um, about that work and the work you've done since, because you've been making films ever since arriving. Yeah. Um, just to answer to what James 
uh, ask first. Uh, uh, the bodies that we see in Asmat, uh, it was a shooting of a flash mob, which the people who were there were supposed to, um, to do the, su such a flash mob. But it was interesting because they have, uh, from one side, it was they were supposed to be 368 people. Uh, but it was so hard to find 680, uh, 68 people alive uh, who, who could participate in that moment while the days is as simple as it is. Uh, and it was so, so, so hard to find people who were collaborative, just <clears throat> detached from the documentary because nobody knew that I was supposed to, to shoot also those moments. But it was not uh, exactly to, to the film. It would have helped, and as it helped, those shootings. Uh, but that was not the only thing that I was thinking. The only thing that were, <coughs> excuse me, were, were the names. <coughs> the names were important. And the bodies in that part is due to the, the flash mob that was organized. The other interesting thing is that there was uh, this artist, um, Nicola Serezini, who, who already have done some works regarding migration and, and um, pictures. He had drawn um, very interesting and beautiful images. And we met online and then we talked and I asked him if he can interpret that day and that moment. So it's a, a bit uh, collective working. And there is Aidan, the, the girl who is uh, who's telling them those names. The text, of course, is fundamental, was very important. The text that I wrote, I prepared, was supposed to be uh, one of the, the message uh, that could, that should uh, uh, slap the, the the public who might uh, who, who might have been expecting some easy and relaxing movie anyway. And, <laughs> but it's tough, yeah, to to keep people seeing these characters, unknown characters on of Giz, which is which are alphabets in, used in Horn of Africa, in Ethiopia and Eritrea. So this is the, the purpose of using the body. Yeah, it's very tough to um, make recite also those people, you know, asking them to come and participate and then filming. In any case, it's very delicate using the body, but you cannot do without also because at the same time those are the reasons why you are there because they are they are dying people are dying and those bodies are detached from the from those names and you might ignore them in a graphic uh, way but you don't have to use them because if it is about graphic and bodies the 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 picture of uh, Alan Kurdi, the, the little kid who died at the uh, Turkish and Greek border, was enough for the whole um, society to understand how dramatic uh, is. Seeing a baby at the, at the beach side was, was already enough. And the funny thing, and what, what makes me angry is that this. Why do why do films or images are uh, exhausting, as, as Christian said, no, exhausting? The, the, because what we are looking for is exhausted. What we are asking is exhausted. We don't ask about Alan Kurdi's father. Uh, few people have talked about him. But a lot of, uh, many people talked about that picture, that kid. And it was not only him, there is his father who was supposed to bear all his life uh, knowing that his kid didn't make it and he instead is 
on the other side of the, the border. So these are the things that might uh, uh, spark the, 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 the society in order that he can or she can uh, reflect on such issues. So the, the, it, it's really, really, really rare to see um, uh, migrants in many documentaries laughing. You don't see it. But those are the only moments where we remember that we were alive while we were in the travel. Uh, and the nun said is always left apart. And that is what changes the, the quality or the, 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 that makes, uh, that fulfills the humanity of the migrants as a, as a person. If we take off the nun said and we are concentrated on what um, the migrant is, uh, has, has lived, he becomes only the expert of his own disgrace and nothing else. Thank you, Doug Maui. Uh, thank you so much for that. And there was, actually, we're gonna, I'm going to start reading some of the comments in the chat and in the Q&A for our last uh, section of this. And I see that um, uh, Ruth Novacek had said, yes, Doug Maui, thank you. What about the father of the child who died on the beach and the migrant laughing? So I think she wants to hear even more from you about that in, in appreciation of those points. Do you want to take a minute to say something more? Or, yeah, 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 yeah. That is what I, I, what we have heard. I'm not in Greece, but I, I know that he went away and he was welcomed in, a, in the Nordic states. I, I think these are the stories that I would have wished to hear, the continuous uh, life of this person, this man who, who, who bears the, 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 the uh, while he, the picture of his kid is all over the world and he is assisting alone maybe uh, th this dramatic moment. Uh, and and while the, the the other side of laughing is uh, it's really I have seen a, a very interesting documentary, very good, beautiful documentary done by three uh, directors, uh, Les Sauteurs, uh, the, those who jump, uh, and it 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 is the only documentary that I have encountered where you really see the non said you see in that documentary a football uh, competition you see uh, 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 an improvising doctor who cures a migrant and there are uh, um, sacrificing a, 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 how do you call it uh, a turkey or uh, Sac sacrificing in order to see, to imagine what future they might have. So all those things were do make part of the life of the migrant and not only the burden. And there are a lot of things where those uh, protagonists in that film uh, reminds me of my own story while I was crossing. Because if it is what it was not for those funny moments, life wouldn't would have been unbearable in, in, during the travel. It's not only because you see um, people getting relations, uh, ladies and men who get together and continue their life afterward, after the journey, but they, have, they might have way, met in the travel. These are all the nuns who, who really are important to, 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 to give uh, humanity or more picture about the migrant. Thank you, Doug Maui. Yes, the, the lives and not only the deaths. Thank you. Thank you for that. And thanks for that question. Uh, there are two more questions. I think I'm going to read them both. They're both very interesting. And you all as panelists can pick which you'd like to answer. There's one from Osgo Okte saying, I wonder if there's any approach about a solution. We look at these photos, we look at these films, but the documentarist also needs to think about a solution 
from from their perspective. I cannot see any clear I cannot see any clear solution for now, and that makes me sad. We are watching, and as the Western middle class getting more depressed, how, when can we talk about the solution? So that is one one plea. And then from Glenda Huerto, uh, the question, thanks for this amazing seminar. I was wondering, with these new perspectives about the way the migrant subject is presented, shifting as a subject with memory, with history, then who is the ultimate audience? To whom are we telling these stories? To the people who migrate, to the European fortress citizens, to the family who waits on the other side. So who who is your imagined audience? I think these are all uh, great questions. And we've, we're pasting them. I see Mark is pasting them into the link, into the uh, chat. So who would like who would like to speak to this? These go to all of these concerns about your subjects, your audiences, and the forms that you have chosen. and the films that you both are studying, Christian and James, and how you see them uh, from your perspective. Amal, do you want to answer any part of this? Uh, yes. Any part of it that you like? Yeah. Uh, I, could, I could even answer both because I, I think it's, um, I mean, I will start with the, with the uh, last question uh, um, about the audience. I think um, for us, for, for me, for Khaled, we and the, the team, we, we feel like if the film could, the least could do uh, is to connect with people, with the human beings, and to, um, to show the, the story from different perspective than, than what we see in the media. This is what we really uh, um, wish. And uh, we don't want, uh, I mean, we don't have uh, um, preferable uh, um, audience um, because it could be it could talk to each differently. For instance, for a migrant, it, it could uh, help that um, it could say that we we know what what you've gone through and you are. I mean, you are. Um, but I mean, I, I hear. I don't want to say that you are not alone. You are not alone, but you are alone because you are. Your experience is unique, and it's it's yours. Nobody would could take it from you, and this is very important to tell because uh, uh, we have a, a, a problem of uh, representation. That, for instance, I I I feel like I don't want uh, be representing uh, refugees because we are different. That it's sim as simple as that, and like, I mean, as I say it now, I I feel privileged now. I, I that I survived. People are still uh, uh, somewhere else uh, right now and couldn't do, like, couldn't come and settle and be with their families. So, what I'm telling right now is sorry, it's just my cat. Uh, <laughs> it's just like. Um, um, the film could speak to different uh, people. The Western, uh, definitely, we would also like to reach the Western people because they are important. It's their countries. Their, uh, they they are concerned. It's the politics of their countries, and um, um, we don't expect. I mean, um, this is an answer for the other question. I I believe I I don't personally expect that there's. A film that could change the world. <laughs> it's it's nothing could change what 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 is happening now except the people. And um, I think it's really uh, we always. I, I get back to Dagnawi. If if something should has changed, it would have happened since uh, uh, the death of. Uh, um, sorry. Uh, uh, Alan. Alan. Alan, sorry, uh, of Alan, and um, yeah, I mean, it's it's really it's heartbreaking that each time something happened and you feel how big it is, and you get get all this support, and at the same time, it's we forget it. Like I just forget the name right now. We forget it instantly, and it's it's it vanished. So uh, I don't think there's a solution that we could do as filmmakers. 
And I, I see that we should not be asked as, as filmmakers to, um, to like do political films. I think our films should be, uh, of course, who wants to make political film should make a political film. Who, who thinks that the, like you don't need to, to say um, direct politics in your film, then you shouldn't say it directly. So it's just a matter of, uh, um, um, as I believe that politics and everything, so whatever you, 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 you feel and uh, you want to talk about your position right now and the people who are uh, uh, being represented in, in this position. Um, so it will be enough. In my Great. Great. Dagmawi, Christian, do you want to say uh, anything? I, I, just, I just answer, when it's a very interesting question. Who, to whom are you doing this film? Yeah, this is uh, what I have been reflecting uh, in, in in these years, since I have done also ASMAT, uh, it's very important to to know, identify to which public are you addressing your films, because many things, my past film would have been something else if it was addressed to an African audience. Many things would have been ignored and many others would have, which should have been included. So the, 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 the fact that I am uh, imagining the public is very important. And what I am doing now is uh, it's time for me, I think, as a director or a filmmaker to, to, to uh, restitute those stories to where they came from uh, by, by uh, narrating the stories to the African public. And I think it's important when I said it at the first, uh, at the beginning, which external powers or which external factors do influence my documentaries. I was meaning the same thing, which is the external factors are the market and the, the society to whom I am addressing my film. But I think we should uh, start, I think I should start and concentrate to ignore completely the European society as to whom to address because uh, for the European society should intercept those stories and not be the receiver of those story to whom should be told. And I think that makes the European society or here uh, the possibility to see some sort of, I don't want to say it, but I have to say it, <laughs> authenticity in, 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 in the, in the uh, when, when I talk about Italy or when I talk about the my migration uh, situation, it's completely different when, when I do it with somebody who have done the same travel or who knows me back in my country many things could change. So the European society public audience should be, should assist while those testimonies reach the, the real public, which is the, the where, where those people came from or where we come from. So in such a way, we exclude that the migrants should be, should supposed to, uh, to talk about the burdens only, uh, but also other things. This is the way to exclude the repetition of uh, the stories. Thank Maybe. you. Yeah, thank you for that, Dagmari. Can I ask you one thing um, before you close off sound? Uh, if, if, I don't know if you can give us an example, but what might be an example if you were speaking to an Ethiopian audience, not to Europeans? What would be an example of something you would put there that you have not put in films that have a targeted Western audience, European audience, yeah, Northern I would have, audience. Yeah, maybe it would have been uh, useless saying why I went away from Ethiopia. <laughs> that is the key question. Who, 
that completely uh, could be uh, ignored because I am introducing myself to the European public by saying that I came because in my country there is such, 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 such. such. So this is one of the things that I, I just gave you as an example because, and I would have went through the stories and not explaining and justifying my, my departure or my journey. Uh, I don't know if I, I, I but, made it clear. Yeah, yeah, very much. Very much. Um, Amal, Christian, James, do you, we have some other questions here. Do you want to say something or do you want me to read some more from the chats? While you think, I'm going to read you some more. Uh, Roy Grunman asks uh, about the question of reaching audience. It's permeating much of non-fictional media and experimental media. And um, he, uh, he cites uh, Harun Faroqi and others, labor in a single shot. Um, can the many subjects represented in these videos see the films? What are the politics of first world representation of precarious subjects, um, say, in the global south? So that's a, a different way of thinking about audience, who gets to be in the film versus who gets to see it. Um, Agnes Woolley. Uh, I wonder whether the recent increase in representation of refugee characters in genre, uh, so this is for James, I think, per is permitting a kind of narrative plenitude whereby refugees aren't destined to speak exclusively to their experience as refugees, but get to be characters in other ways, I suppose. And thinking about his house, um, Amulet, Limbo, Le Havre, and the other side of hope by Karismaki. So that's another question. Just putting these out so you can all think about them as I'm reading them. Um, from Victoria Paranyuk, uh, thanks so much for sharing your films. Thoughts on this topic. Uh, wants to know how to get the films. Uh, we'll, we, there's some information in the chat and we can get some other information to you. We can put on the website. Um, uh, let's see. Um, Catherine Bedemu says, these films are the closest I've seen to conveying migrant subjectivity. Thank you for this incredible work to Dagmawi and Amo. And Irina Lambacher is curious what you all think of Ai Weiwei's films. So there's, there's a selection of things to choose from depending what you would like to talk about. Oh, and um, Bena Shu, Relatedly, wondering how you as filmmakers hold those responsible in your work. Who is accountable? And I think this goes back to your other project, Amo. What is the role of justice in your filmmaking process? Is it there? Um, so uh, I wonder if, I, as you're thinking, I just want to give a minute um, to Amo uh, about, I know you've talked about forensic architecture, but could you just sort of say something for the audience about the, the other version, the, the, the kind of unpacking of the journey that you did in that project so people know you're, what you're referencing? Uh, exactly. In, in, in the beginning, as I've said, like we, we were looking for a, uh, to go legally to, to, to the court with, with the footages because um, we, we wanted to understand more what, what really ha has happened, how, how we had to, why, why we, we had to stay in the water for more than um, I mean, almost three hours and uh, why 43 people has to die and um, why, for instance, for me, this was the biggest question. Why, after seeing, I mean, um, like the, the, the ship of um, Frontex, the European uh, uh, border security border agency, uh, it was there from the very beginning. It was there almost 15 minutes after the incident. So there was this question, why, why it's not doing anything? It was a way. It, it didn't even came closer, and we 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 felt. I mean, I felt. Let's talk about uh, uh, what I experienced. It's is that I was frustrated. I felt that they are just watching, and it felt horrible <laughs> that somebody is watching you. The same thing applies to the to the heli helicopter because it was up there. It was actually not only watching. It was causing some problems with, uh, it, it was uh, will, willing, I don't know how to, to say it. And uh, the waves were getting higher and everybody was affected with it. 
Uh, and here was the moment where I say that I was in control of the camera because I simply, I just raised my hand to, to film it because in the, in the helicopter, somebody was filming and it was very close that I could see. So just imagine the, 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 what we used to see in the uh, in films, in fiction films or in other films that if you see a, an airplane or if you see a helicopter and you are in a, in a bad situation, you just wave. <laughs> and we couldn't do this. And we were waving with, and we, we see it. So um, it was very important to do something uh, uh, legally. And uh, we thought of forensic architecture because we, we, we knew their work. They were really amazing with, with the, uh, their investigation films. Uh, they didn't only made their films uh, film based on uh, the footage that I, I had. Uh, they also uh, brought some footages from um, volunteers, like uh, Jitski volunteers, Proactiva, uh, from the, the um, Greek Coast Guard. So they had different sources. They almost gave a, a panoramic uh, view to the, uh, to the incident and what happened. And um, their perspective was huge, was very important because people, as I said, wanted to know, and I wanted to know what happened. But it wasn't enough for, for, for us as, as people, as human beings and as filmmakers. I think it wasn't enough because um, um, we wanted to tell the story our way and from this perspective. So um, it was important to, to also go to Thank this. you. Yeah, thank you, Amo. Um, James and Christian, we're coming to the end of the session and we haven't had a chance to go back to you. Are there some final comments you'd like to add before we sign off? I'm going to unmute James, you both. I yeah. Think, I think those questions were for, for James, really, about the genre, films, and so on. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. but, but you might have some other thoughts after hearing all of this, Christian. A lot of I don't want to deny you that moment. Uh, a lot of thoughts, for sure. Um, I was thinking a bit about this, the exhausting images um, and exhausted images as well. They're exhausting to, to watch, exhausted in the sense of circulated endlessly. Um, but. There's also something I think I, you know, I, I observed um, in, in the work of Philip Scheffner, for example, that the editor of Mal's film, he made another film called Havari, that some of you might be familiar with, um, where he stretches out a very uh, a short clip of, of a dinghy or a, a refugee boat in um, outside North Africa, and he's sort of using ex as a counter or a resistance kind of measure uh, to ex exhaust the image in another sense. So I was thinking about when I, I wrote that or used that phrase, uh, I think there is also perhaps, even though it's uh, coming out of a very sort of terrible predicament, it's um, perhaps there is some potential as well in exhausting the image in the sense that you, we, we can go away from these representations and, and move towards something else, uh, as Philip Schaffner, uh, for example, does in his film. And he arrives at, uh, at something else that is not really in the rea realm of representative um, documentary filmmaking, but something else. So I just wanted to add that, uh, that I think the exhausted image is, is both uh, something, <laughs> um, I mean, we have got gotten used to and, and um, it's just something that sort of saturates the media. Um, but there is perhaps, or I think already, especially experimental filmmakers or, or um, people like Scheffner, but also Amal and Khaled, uh, in a sense, push the, the image, in a sense, exhaust the image, but in a more creative way. So I just wanted to add that, that I think there Great. is perhaps a potential in that. Great. James, any last words? 
I don't want to give the last word. I'm not sure okay. that's the role I want. <laughs> but, but can I just say that, that I think that, that those films, including Havari, that Kristen just mentioned, and the films that we've been talking about, Bayamel and um, Tegmawi, are about the aesthetic. They're, they're, work, they're working on the aesthetic. I mean, Christian talks in his article about wake work, the term uh, from um, Christina Sharp. Um, and it is about sort of dealing with um, trauma, the catastrophe aesthetically. And, and what I think is so amazing about these two films um, is, is that there is something totally um, kind of free and creative about them. Um, they are creating more kind of relations. This goes back to um, what um, Demar was talking about. You know, how do you kind of move beyond that image of the boy, which we know was manipulated by the media and talk about the family and talk about the context and talk about, you know, that within a larger picture. And I think both of the films are able to do that by fragmenting, by opening up gaps. And, and that's the work of the aesthetic and how then to prevent that being frozen um, and solidified by the political once film as creative, as powerful as this, um, is allowed to kind of work through, um, you know, its audiences, how to prevent that from being sort of frozen by kind of the political need to explain it, to make it readable. Um, and I suppose, therefore, you know, I see the, the, these films as, as, as very unlike some of the documentaries uh, that are coming out of Africa, West Africa, for example, um, where it is, it's grassroots documentary, but it's it's very straightforward, it's very readable. Whereas these films are not readable, they're about opacity, they're about refraction, they're about the poetic, it's work and, and it's hard work for the viewer. And I was scared as hell watching um, Purple Sea. It was a very disturbing film for me, but it was also the text of desire, it was the text of liberation, and that's the work of the aesthetic. Well, thank you for that, James. I, I think that's important to see that, you know, the aesthetic is not the enemy of justice or evidence and Absolutely. that they can coexist. I think that's uh, terrific. Um, thanks, everybody, for this work. And I think um, I'm going to be thinking about, I know that I'm going to be thinking about what you said for a long time. And I'm kind of leaving with this notion of of slapping the public that you introduced, Doug Maori. I like that very much. And the quest for justice that you've pursued both visually and legalistically, Amal. Um, I really thank you, Christian, for bringing this work to our attention and James for joining with us today and to this wonderful audience that's been so involved and has had such great points to raise. Um, we keep doing these. Uh, we're planning one uh, coming up uh, in uh, June or July on um, Asian, um, um, Asian American Pacific Islander documentary and the rise in anti-Asian violence. And we will keep these going. We're gonna to try to do one every month tied to some of the issues and articles we've been publishing. And I love this combination of having you as filmmakers and you as scholars here together in the room as it were. And um, I'll continue to appreciate this um, very slight uh, positive side effect of the pandemic. Um, stay well, everyone. Stay safe. Thank you so much for your attention and your time and your contributions as artists and scholars. Thank you. <laughs>